Okay, now I know we just started, but what I'd like you to try in just a few seconds is to pause this video for about 30 seconds and write down as many examples of animals as you can think of. You ready? Okay, go ahead and pause the video and try it now. Alright, now we are going to refer back to this towards the end of the video, but let's just put that list aside for now. So when we talk about the organisms of the animal kingdom, we are talking about some of the most advanced and complex and diverse organisms that we have classified. So next time you're hanging out with your fungi or plant friends, you can brag a little bit. Now in terms of the characteristics of the organisms in this kingdom, obviously being in the domain Eukarya, they are eukaryotic. Within their cells they have membrane enclosed organelles. We know that they are heterotrophic, meaning that they rely on other organisms for their nutrients, for their source of energy, for their food. We know that they are multicellular, meaning that they're made up of more than one cell. In terms of their cellular structure, they lack cell walls. They do have cell membranes, but in terms of the rigid structure of a cell wall that we saw in plants, not in the animal kingdom. We know that these organisms reproduce sexually, that is, that they require genetic input from at least one other individual and that these organisms have fairly advanced, uh, and in some cases very advanced, nervous systems or structures that respond to uh, and detect various stimuli within the environment. Now, while we can group all of these organisms together based on these shared characteristics, there's a wide variety and array of the way that these organisms go about some of these characteristics and the way that they display or demonstrate some of these characteristics. But before we get to those, and before we start classifying these organisms, we have to talk a little bit about their importance. So we know that these organisms are an important source of food. I mean, we eat these other organisms, and not only that, I just said they were heterotrophic, so we know that they have to rely on other organisms. But even more than that, we have to rely on the action and behavior of some of these organisms. Pollinators are extremely important in the cross-pollination and fertilization of various food products, including fruit. And we can utilize organisms in this kingdom to better understand ourselves as well. We can monitor and observe how they respond to a particular disease. We can think about their characteristics and their behaviors and how that reflects back on maybe some of our own characteristics or behaviors. We have these organisms within our houses or in our properties, maybe sometimes for transportation, but certainly as pets. But just like the other videos in this series on biodiversity, the main purpose, the main focus, the main goal of this video is to classify and characterize organisms within this particular kingdom. But before we go into the different groupings that we have in this particular kingdom, we have to think about how we are going to classify them. That is, what characteristics are we going to take a look at? So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is something called body symmetry. So there's a couple of different body symmetries that we look for when observing and classifying organisms within this particular kingdom. First we have a radial symmetry. Now this radial symmetry is one that you can kind of envision if you were cutting up a pizza or you were cutting up a cake or something like that, where if we were to take each section or slice of this pizza or cake, it would be identical to any one of the other sections in this piece. So the other characteristic symmetry that we look at is something called bilateral symmetry. So that means if we were to take a mirror and bisect an organism, the right side would look similar to the left side and vice versa. So we can use these different body plans or these body symmetries to help us categorize and classify some of the organisms in this kingdom. The next thing that we're going to take a look at is development. So as this organism develops, how many tissue layers does it develop through its embryonic stage? And all the animals are going to have at minimum two. They're going to have an ectoderm, which is going to develop into sort of the outer coverings, and the endoderm, which is going to develop into the inner coverings. And then as we get more complex, there's a mesoderm, a middle layer, that develops into a body cavity. And some of the organisms that we're going to classify have a full body cavity, and some of them have a partial body cavity. But that's going to allow us, or that's going to help us, to try and classify and categorize these organisms into the different groupings that we're going to get to. And we can also take a look at the development of the oral cavity. That is, as this organism is developing, does the oral cavity, the opening, the mouth, develop first, and this is what we refer to as a protostome, or does it develop second, and this is what we refer to as a deuterostome. 
Now all of these things aren't really going to mean much to you right now, but as we go through a progression in the complexity of these organisms, I'm going to keep referring back to some of these characteristics that we look at in order to help us classify these organisms in terms of increasing complexity. So just like we did with the plants, I'm going to ask you to envision the way that we move through these different groupings of organisms within the animal kingdom in terms of increasing complexity. So one of the first group of organisms that we're going to take a look at in this kingdom is the simplest grouping. We refer to these as the peripherin, or more commonly known as the sponges. So the sponges are recognizable because of their lack of body shape. They are amorphous. They do not display radial symmetry, nor do they display bilateral symmetry. They have an opening that serves as a mouth. And the mouth and amorphous shape are basically the characteristic features of this phylum of organisms. So the next step that we're going to take a look at are organisms that have developed a specialized nervous system or an ability to detect and respond to external stimuli. And the organisms that we're going to take a look at here in terms of increasing complexity are the nadarians. So most readily, the type of organism that you would recognize from this particular phylum would be the jellyfish. They have relatively simple organ systems and display radial symmetry, but they do have a nervous system, so they can respond and do respond to external stimuli. So the next group of organisms we're going to look at, in fact, the next several groups of organisms we're going to look at are classified as protostomes. That is, the first opening that develops ultimately forms the mouth. And the first group of organisms that we look at actually only have one opening. And these are the flatworms. So the flatworms, in a phylum that we refer to as platyhelminthes, are acelomates. They lack a body cavity. They have only one opening, so food and waste goes into and out of the same opening, and they lack circulatory and respiratory systems. Most of the exchange of nutrients and waste that goes on with their environment would be directly through diffusion, which is facilitated by their flat shape. In terms of classifying or categorizing these organisms, you will recognize them obviously by their flat shape and that they have a head region which will attach typically to their host as many of these organisms are parasitic and a tail region which can be many meters long. Now the rotifers are probably not a group of organisms that you have seen all that much unless of course you have been looking through a microscope at pond samples or freshwater samples which is where most of these organisms are found. They do lack circulatory and respiratory systems, but in terms of identifying these organisms, they are fairly characteristic in their appearance. You will notice the shape of this organism as being attached typically to some type of substrate or other substance where they are then going to use the cilia to direct food into their mouths. The nematodes, or roundworms, are what we refer to as pseudocelomate. So these are the first types of organisms that we're going to see that have a partially developed coelom or body cavity that's going to form. In terms of classifying them, their bodies are unsegmented. They are tubular or round, and most of the time these organisms are found within other organisms. That is, they are parasitic. Now we're going to start getting into organisms that you are going to probably recognize a little bit easier, and the first one is what we refer to as a mollusk. Now the mollusks are fairly diverse in their appearance, as you can have clams or squid or even octopuses in this particular grouping but they all share some characteristics. They have three main unsegmented body parts. They possess a foot, a visceral mass, and a mantle. And in most of these organisms, that mantle is going to secrete a shell. Now, in some of the organisms, the shell is more noticeable. In others, it's very small, and in others, it's absent altogether. Almost all of them have a special file-like radula, almost like teeth, that are going to be used for scraping and boring, for allowing them to feed. And they all possess complete digestive systems, circulatory systems, and gills. So we're now going to take a look at our third grouping of worms. We looked at the platyhelminthes, the flatworms, we looked at the roundworms, the nematodes, and now we're going to take a look at the annelids. These are the segmented worms. And so in terms of being able to classify them or identify them, you can see some clear body segmentation, different portions of the body. And that's why we're looking at these in terms of a little bit more complexity, because they do have different segments of the body. And even though we most associate annelids and segmented worms with groundworms or earthworms, most of the organisms in this phylum are actually marine. The final grouping of protostomes is the largest, not only of the protostomes, but also of all the animal kingdom as well. And those are the arthropods. Now the arthropods are extremely diverse. We're talking insects, spiders, ticks, scorpions, shrimp, lobsters, crayfish, crabs, anything that has a segmented body with jointed appendages. 
and an exoskeleton. Now these exoskeletons are composed of chitin, which is something that you may recognize or recall from being a component of the cell wall of fungi. They have very complex sensory systems, and we see some of this through antennae that we notice in a number of these organisms. They have complete digestive, excretory, and circulatory systems, and as I've mentioned, they are extremely diverse, not only in their appearance, but also in their function, but most of them play very important roles as consumers, primary consumers typically, in aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. And I've already talked about the importance of pollinators, of which insects are an extremely important subgroup of those. And speaking of subgroup, insects are a class within the arthropod phylum and are identifiable because at some point during their development they have or possess wings. And as such, these are the only invertebrates that are capable of flight. So the next and final couple of groups of organisms that we're going to take a look at are classified as deuterostomes. That is, the opening that ultimately forms the mouth forms second. So it forms second after the opening that's ultimately going to be used for egestion. And the first group of organisms that we're going to take a look at here are what we refer to as the echinoderms. The echinoderms encompass a group of organisms that include something that we would recognize or call a starfish or a sea star. And even though, as an adult, they display radial symmetry, early on in their embryological development they display or demonstrate bilateral symmetry. So as they develop, they typically have five or more arms, they possess a complete digestive system, a relatively simple circulatory system, and no respiratory or excretory systems to speak of. They don't have a cephalic or head region. Their nervous system typically extends into their arms and circles their mouth. Now, one of the really interesting things about this group of organisms is that they have a water-filled vascular system that allows them not only to move, but to capture and manipulate prey. The final grouping of organisms that we're going to take a look at are the ones that you and I are both a part of, and those are the chordates. Now, some of the characteristics that these organisms share is that during some part in their life cycle, they possess a notochord, uh, some pharyngeal slits, and a post-anal tail. And yes, that includes you too. And while there are some subgroupings here, like the tunicates, we are going to spend our time looking at the vertebrates. So in addition to the notochord, vertebrates get their name from the vertebrae, or bony coverings of the dorsal nerve cord to house and protect it. They have paired appendages, or paired limbs, a bony skeleton, and specifically an endoskeleton, that is a skeleton on the inside, which allows these organisms to reach rather large sizes, certainly much larger than the invertebrates. Now, the vertebrates are some of the most interesting and complex organisms that we have on this planet, and I'm certainly not going to do them justice here in this video. But very quickly, if we take a look at some of these classes, we can see that there are numerous classes of fish, ranging from the bony fish, like the trout and pickerel and bass that we're familiar with, to the cartilaginous fish, like the sharks and rays. We can see that we have amphibians as a class, these organisms that uh, lay eggs in water that primarily breathe through their skin, and that we typically associate with frogs and salamanders. We see the class of reptiles, these cold-blooded, dry-skinned organisms that we typically associate with things like turtles, crocodiles, and snakes. Birds, unlike their closely related relatives, are warm-blooded, they do have feathers, they have beaked jaws, and, like their relatives, lay hard-shelled eggs. We refer to these eggs as amniotic eggs, and it's one of the things that allowed these organisms to survive on dry land, away from sources of water. These waterproof eggs protect the developing embryo inside, and are characteristic usually of reptiles and birds, but interestingly enough, there are some mammals that do lay these amniotic eggs. And speaking of mammals, this class of organisms are warm-blooded, they give birth to live young, and feed these young through mammary glands, hence the name. So while all of the organisms in this kingdom share some fundamental characteristics, I think it's safe to say, even after skimming the surface of some of the different phyla and, in some cases, order or classes of the organisms in this particular kingdom, that it is massively diverse. Now, what I want you to do is take that grouping of however many organisms you came up with at the beginning of this video and see how many of those can be counted as mammals. Some of them? A few? Most? All? Almost all people, when they write down their list of animals that they know, 
will invariably list 90% or more of them as mammals. Now, if we take a look at the true count of classified organisms, mammals account for less than half of 1% of the organisms in this kingdom. Now, why do you think that is? Well, it's probably because they're the ones that we most associate with. I mean, we are a mammal, and we eat mammals, and we have mammals as pets, and they're big for the most part, so we can see them easily. But, hopefully after watching this video, you will have a little bit more appreciation for the different groupings of organisms that can be found in our own animal kingdom. Thanks for watching.